know as soon as sure. I get it going. So we'll just let people take their time coming in. I know a few people said they only have an hour. I gave us two hours just for the luxury of having that time and mm -hmm. you know seeing if people could block that time out, but it may not take us that long. So okay, great. Yes, well, we I mean if this works for you, we put together a, a slide deck to walk through the questions and walk through the issues. Great. And in the course of that, we would get to your your questions as we go. Okay. Um, and there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff we'll need to discuss. We don't need to discuss it all today. So right, right. our hope is to kind of tee up the issues yes. and then at the end, just decide how are we going to work on, you know, resolve these things together. Or, yep. Sounds great. Yeah. We are going to just confirm our meeting schedule. I think this morning, hopefully uh, really the only, there's only three of us that are actual voting members because we represent each community. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is um, more just interested parties and activists that have been involved in this from the very mm -hmm. beginning. So, um, you know, that's, that's fine. Let me just, people are. And I invited a group of my colleagues to the call. I hope that's okay. I can't remember whether I asked if it was, but I. I it's totally fine. It. So I'm assuming Kim and Marlena. Is it Marlena? Yes. Or Marlena or Marlana? Marlena. Marlena. Okay. Let me um, bring them in. Marlena, I'm letting you in. And Kim, I'm letting you in now. And there, there may be a third, Julie. Okay. Great. Good to know. Hey, Paul. Hey, Chris, how are you? All right. Excited about this meeting. Yes, me too. We're, we're, we're excited to get excited to get going. There we go. Great. Hi, Marlena. Hi, Kim. Hi there. And if you see a um, Excuse me, a Julie Harris joined. She's also with our team. Okay, great. Okay, great. Good morning. Good morning, Kim. Morning, Kim. And are, I'm getting an, an echo. Are other folks getting an echo? Yes. Yes. And is it just when I talk? Well, we didn't have it when you and I started. So I think it was right. when Marlena and Kim joined, we started to get an echo. It muted now, so I think it's going away. Yep. Uh, it's, I'm the culprit, Stephanie. I, I got you on mute. Hi, Paul. Okay. Hey, Tom. Hi, Tom. Thanks. I asked only because it's usually me. For some reason, something <laughs> about my ear, my ear things just create an echo about 50% of the time. So that's why I, I asked. There's just one other, one or two other people I want to give a moment to join. So, and will Julie definitely be joining us? Yes, she said she would. I do also know she's been having a little bit of internet connectivity, so it's possible if that happens to her today, she may be a little bit delayed, but she's definitely planning to join. Okay, great. Just good to know. I just want to keep my eye out for her. Yeah. Hi, Andrew. Certainly start Stephanie and every yep. team is here and Julie can join when she's available and we'll fill her in. What yep. happened great. before she got here. Sure. Yes. Yeah. So I think the folks that I was waiting on from our team are all here now. So um, thank you, everybody. I just want to make the announcement that this meeting is being recorded. So um, it starts automatically as soon as we enter the room. So I just want to give you that heads up. And we do have a little bit of um, just housekeeping on our end that we just have to get through because we've had, there's only three of us that need to vote, but we need to approve our minutes from the last three meetings. And I wanna do it while we still have Tom because I know he may not be able to stay throughout the whole meeting. So I'm just gonna start with that really quickly. Um, Tom and Chris, I hope you had an opportunity to review the minutes ahead of time. If any of you other folks that are part of the working group wanna comment on the minutes, that's fine. Um, I'm gonna start with each set um, and give an opportunity for edits if there are anybody, you know, anybody has a proposed change. So I'm going to start with the minutes of 
June 3rd. And do I have a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Seconded. Okay, and all in favor, just a voice, aye. Aye. Tom? Okay, and I'm an I, so minutes of the third are approved. Um, the minutes of June 17th. So moved. Seconded. It would be louder on the phone. Okay, and um, so in, to approve the minutes of the 17th, Chris? Yes. Tom? Yes. And I'm a yes. And the minutes of June 24th, could I have a motion? So moved. Seconded. Okay, and the vote to approve? Yes. Chris? Tom? Aye. And I'm also a yes. So minutes are approved. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you, Darcy, so much for taking the minutes for us. Greatly appreciate that. Thank you, Darcy. Okay, to my only really quick um, comment about the, the meeting frequency, I'm just gonna start easy. If this becomes a more complicated conversation, we'll move this to later in the meeting so that we can get right to Paul and his team. Um, but our Fridays, either at 10 or one o'clock, okay for you, Chris and Tom primarily. All things being equal, either of those times are fine. Uh, I just occasionally, as, as has been witnessed in June, get stuck in some kind of transit situation. But yeah, those times work for me. Okay, Chris, do you have a preference to those days? Does, nope, do Fridays they work, work? They work for me. Okay, and either time works for you? Mm -hmm. Do we want to then uh, have a preference for 10 a.m. or 1 yes. p.m.? 10 a.m.? 10 a.m. would work for me. Okay. That's good. Thanks. Okay. Uh, all our other members who are typically part of the working group, do any of you have comments or would, would 10 a.m. on Fridays be okay for you for the majority of the time at least? Andrea, you too? It depends on the um, week. Yeah, I, I have a regular Friday 10, uh, 11 o'clock meeting, um, but it, it will change in a month or so so okay so for now i mean and we are typically our meetings are about an hour so if we just say fridays at 10 um for the most part work and sam i know you can't always join us but would that be okay for you yeah that works for me thanks stephanie okay great then our next meeting will be so we're saying every two weeks so our next meeting would be july 22nd at 10 a.m Excellent. Okay, then um, the only quick update I have that I wanted to let people know is that we do have a web page uh, for the Valley Green Energy Working Group that's on the Amherst website. I sent you all links, um, not at this meeting, but please take a look at it. And if there are things people want to edit, change, Chris, take a look at your title. I think I might have it wrong. Um, <laughs> because I, I think it was different than I thought. So, you know, take a look if there are edits, just please send them to me, suggested changes, and then we can discuss them at the next meeting. So that will be one of our agenda items. So, but the, the agendas are up there, minutes will be up there. I post them, the drafts are always in the packets, but I don't post them under the minutes until we actually approve them. Mm -hmm. So these three sets will, will be posted um, probably by the end of today. So uh, yeah, so that was exciting to actually have a real presence there now too. So, well, with that, I wanna um, move this along and pass this on over to Paul and your team. And we Wonderful. can do, we should do a quick round of introductions. I'm sorry, I didn't think about that. We should probably introduce ourselves first. So I'll start very quickly. Um, hi everybody, I'm Stephanie Ciccarello. I'm the sustainability coordinator for the town of Amherst. Um, and I'm gonna, why don't we popcorn? I'll just pass this along to Chris Mason and then you can choose the next person. Chris Mason, Energy and Sustainability Officer for the City of Northampton. Despite what the websites say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'll pass it on to Tom Thompson. Thanks, Chris. I, I'm staying off 
uh, camera in motion here. Um, I've got a driver, so I'm completely safe. But uh, I'm Tom Thompson. I'm uh, the citizen representative for the town of Pelham. Okay, I'll, I'll pass it on to Darcy on behalf of Tom. Thank you, Stephanie. You're welcome. Darcy, you're oh, muted. Darcy, you're muted. Oh, you're still muted. Okay, I'm gonna pass it on to Adele and we'll get back to you, Darcy. I am Adele Franks. I am a resident of Northampton and a retired public health physician turned climate activist and have been part of this working group for a while now. And I will turn it over to Andra. We can't. Andrew, you're not coming through. You. Of course. Um, I'm uh, in Amherst. I am on the Energy and Climate Action Committee, the town of Amherst, and have been an active uh, participant in this working group for a uh, number of years. And uh, Darcy? Uh, hi, I'm Darcy Dumont. I'm, oh, as Adele and Andrew are, I'm. Uh, now on the board of the local energy advocates which has grown out of our community activist group that is working with this official town multi-municipality group um, so yes community activist and i guess we'll um darcy you want to choose someone from Paul's oh team? sorry or sorry. sam actually sam is with us too Oh, uh, Sam. Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Sam Teitelman. I'm a resident of Amherst and I'm assisting uh, in this CCA process in my capacity as a, an unpaid consultant appointed under um, Northampton's uh, Planning and Sustainability Office. Okay, and with that, I guess, Paul, I will hand it over to you and you can introduce your team and get started. Um, Sure, X. Great, terrific. So I'm I'm Paul Drummer. My role in the project is I'll help with the development of the aggregation plan, help work through some of the um, environmental issues, and handle the regulatory approval process. And I'll hand it to Marlena. Hi, I'm Marlena Patton, and I oversee the um, customer education and outreach, customer support, and day-to-day -day program operations. I'll hand it over to Kim. I'm Kim Pear. I handle the procurements for the aggregations um, and help the town secure pricing for the aggregation program. I'll hand it over to Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Harris. I'm the community outreach manager and I support Marlena in outreach and day-to-day -day operations. Uh, terrific, so I think, uh, did we get everybody? I think Excellent. we've got everybody. Yeah, right. we didn't have uh, Catherine Ratte. Oh, Catherine's here, great. Hi, everybody. I'm Catherine Ratche. I'm the director of the Environment and Land Use Department at the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, the regional planning agency that serves Amherst, Northampton, Pelham, and uh, 40 other cities and towns. And I've been monitoring this process for years. And thank you all for what you're doing. Didn't see you sneak in, Catherine. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. Excellent. So we have a, um, a PowerPoint that we thought we would walk through as a way of bringing up the issues and responding to your questions. Um, so, all right, I'll share my screen or I just went ahead and, and did that. And let me ask, can folks see a PowerPoint slide on the screen now? Yes, yes. excellent. All right, so we'll, um, we'll work through it. And I'll say first, it's really a great pleasure for us to be working with you and to get going on this project. We've really been, been looking forward to it. And I know you have a wonderful team. Some of you I know have known for a while um, uh, Chris in particular, and Tom also, and I've uh, gotten to know some of the others of you, Sam, and through this process, and it's um, uh, great to have a chance to, great to have a chance to work with you. Um, so we put together an agenda. We also thought that introductions would be in order, so we've, we've knocked that one off already. Um, and then we'll walk through the typical program timeline. Um, we'll, we'll then focus from there on reaching the first milestone in that timeline. 
and then we'll raise some areas where we need input. And I'll say there, um, we'll see how it goes with the time. There are a number of issues. Some of them are pretty detailed. We don't anticipate we'll resolve all these questions today. Um, it may be helpful for us just to provide an overview of, of the issues without trying to dig into resolving them. Um, and then we want to talk about next steps, which is how we would work together to, to, to resolve the questions as we go forward. So we'll be laying out the issues today, but not looking necessarily to be getting all the answers to those. Um, so here's a typical program timeline. As you can see, we divided the, the aggregation program into four phases. The first is the aggregation planning and regulatory review, uh, followed by the electricity supply contract and supply procurement, um, then public education. Um, and I say then public education, but public education can actually go through the entire life of the project. You don't have to wait until the other phases are done. And um, it's best, in fact, not to wait, but to get going earlier. Um, and then the final phase would be the program support and management once your program is, is up and going. Now, one thing to flag about this timeline is it's not really to scale. You see that months five through 17, the period of the DPU review is sort of compressed into a small box there just to make the timeline easier to, to see and to, fit on a, and to fit on a slide. Um, you had asked about this in one of your questions, noting that the DPU review process has become very long and asking if there's anything that could be done to speed it up. Um, and it's 100% correct that it has become long. It's well over a year now. We have, I think our longest pending plan is about 18 months now that they've been waiting and some others close on the, the heels of that. Um, there are two um, possible glimmers of hope here that things might be better for your plan. Um, one is that the, the actual, the Senate version of the state budget this year includes a provision that would give the DPU just six months to review aggregation plans and the plans would be approved if the DPU didn't issue its order within six months. Um, we don't know yet whether that will become law. It's in the Senate version of the budget. It's not in the House version. The House and Senate are working now to put together a combined budget. So we'll have to see if it you know, appears in that combined version. Um, and then it goes to the governor and the governor can veto that individual provisions, including that one if, if he wishes. So it's not guaranteed yet, but that's one effort to speed things up. The other is that DPU staff is, is well aware that the current process takes way too long and they're very unhappy about it as well. And, They've told me they're working to put together some initiatives that would um, speed things up quite a bit, um, including trying to just resolve a bunch of the questions um, generically for all the programs at once so they don't have 8 million questions they're trying to decide with regard to each aggregation plan. If that were to happen, it would produce a smoother and, and swifter review path. So those are all possibilities. None of them are set yet. I think the takeaway is just it takes way too long now and there's some chance it's going to be better by the time your plan is filed. Um, so that's the overall that's the overall timeline. What we thought we would focus on today is just as a way of digging into the questions is to focus on that first milestone and what's necessary to get there. And that first milestone is the public uh, presentation of the aggregation plan. So if we go to the next slide. So the, this, in this first milestone, what needs to happen is that the Valley Green Energy needs to present to the, it's the citizens of each of the communities um, the key aggregation documents and to give those citizens an opportunity to comment on them. Um, and those documents are the documents you'll be filing with the Department of Public Utilities. And I'll go through them in more detail on the next slide, but it's the aggregation plan, the education plan, the opt-out letter, and the model contract. All of those need to go to citizens for comment. Um, typically what that means is they're posted on a public website. Um, a note, there's a notice of a public meeting uh, and citizens have the opera of 30 days from the posting to submit written comments or they can come to the public meeting and, and give oral comments at that meeting. The meeting often usually includes a presentation about the plan, an explanation of how the plan would work. Um, 
that meeting can be a standalone public meeting, or it could be piggybacked on some other public meeting that was, you know, being noticed and taking place anyway. Um, we will say that in most communities, um, there's not a great deal of comment on the documents and there's not a great deal of attendance at the public meeting. Um, this is all happening very early, you know, a year or more, typically before the program launches, it all seems very remote to the public. Um, but it's a required step number one. And number two, it is a, it is an occasion to get going on public education and that public education starting it early is very helpful and you do it over time so that by the time you launch your plan, people will be, will be more familiar with the program. Um, you know, the way it works, the preparation of the documents is we'll draft the initial versions, we'll need input from you on a number of questions. And then once you've approved the documents, we'll get that public presentation, work with you to get that public presentation scheduled and to take the comments. Um, this all has to happen first. And then once that's done, we can move to the next milestones, which are a meeting with the Department of uh, with the Department of Energy Resources, and then a filing with the Department of Public Utilities. Uh, let me just briefly describe, since I was talking about these documents, what they are. So the first one is the aggregation plan, which describes at a high level the key features and operations of the program. And it's important to recognize that this is a heavily regulated document. Much of the text is prescribed by the Department of Public Utilities, but there are a few key points that there's decision points for the, the communities to make that will be documents in the document. Then there's a related document called the Education Plan, which describes in a good bit of detail and out initiative will look like and the required back and forth with us fill in what those um, uh, then we what we call here the enrollment notification mailing materials more commonly called the opt-out letter which is a letter that goes to every resident prior to being enrolled in the program explains the program and that the customer can opt out if they want and if they don't opt out they'll be enrolled automatically and that letter this needs to be submitted to the public in advance and is part of what the DPU ultimately will approve. There's the model supply contract, which is a very big contract, which will be signed communities or by the JPE. If you have a JPE at that stage between the, that entity and the electricity supplier, um, the no contract from perspective, the, the supplier gets customers paid their electric bill but it sets out suppliers' responsibilities and it's a big, you know, 30 page, single spaced, sort of technical energy kind of contract. Fortunately, it's been auto contract. It's been used by a whole bunch of tenant communities approved by the DPU multiple times. There's a model for it. You don't have to come up with a new one, but it's part of the set of documents. Um, I can move on for, from there, or if, let me pause so I, and see if there are any questions about what I talked about so far. If anyone has any questions, can you raise your hand? Okay, I don't see anyone with their hand raised, but I actually have a quick question, Paul. Um, in terms of the first public meeting right now, we're still obviously meeting via Zoom um, and wondering how do you typically, does your staff oversee that meeting? Um, or is this one of those details that you work out with each individual community? Um, and how has attendance been if it is virtual? I'm just curious about that. So it's sort of yeah. two, two questions. Yeah, so um, it has very, in, you know, over the last few years, the meetings have been virtual. Um, we coordinate with you, I guess we could do the Zoom meeting, although it, it needs to be a public meeting. So it would be, I think it's more commonly the way it's been done. It's whatever process the, you know, the town uses for its, its meetings. Um, attendance has been light, both virtually and in person. Um, I, I can't remember exactly, but Marlena, do you have a sense of the number of attendees typically? 
I don't, I don't know how to say what's typical given the past few years anymore, to be very honest. In those communities that have highly engaged um, citizen environmental groups, we have seen more participation in these meetings, maybe 20 people will come. In those communities that have less engagement and uh, participation by citizen environmental groups, we will see maybe only the stakeholders who are already involved in developing the program attend. Um, so it kind of depends on, I guess, the flavor of the community. And these meetings will be for each, each community will hold their own. Is that how you're envisioning this? Yes, that's a terrific question, which I hadn't thought about prior to this, but yes, the, given that there are multiple communities here, each one would have to hold its own meeting. Okay. Um, and I did notice someone did have a hand up. Go ahead, Chris. Um, <clears throat> so uh, will the outreach for this be included in the education outreach plan? Um, and is it, is it worth it to actually try to reach out to say disenfranchised communities or you know, other equitable equity-based um, communities that may not be involved at all? Is it worth kind of trying to get them to this public meeting? I guess it's um, partly a question for us too, but. Yes, partly a question for you. I mean, I think, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll let Mar Marlena weigh in too, but I'll just give an initial reaction since I started, which is that outreach to those communities is really important with a goal of helping them understand the program and to make a good choice about whether to participate or not. And by good choice, I mean an informed choice about whether to participate or not. For the for this meeting, which is really about comments on the plan, it's probably not critical for that, those communities. More important for those communities and really everybody is understanding the program when it launches and being able to make to decide whether to participate or not. That's my take. Marlena, do you have a thought on that? Yes, I will try to, as with everything with aggregation, uh, there's no short way of saying anything. So I'll try to make this make sense. Um, so there's, there's what the DPU cares about with regard to outreach to vulnerable and disenfranchised populations and kind of what they see that, that where the minimum bar is, where they, what they see that, that to be. And then there's what is actually required to connect with people, which can be a very different level of effort as you likely know. And so what may make sense for this first version is, or for the first um, outreach, is to make sure we're doing at least the minimum so that the opportunity is there for people to learn about this program and comment on it. I do think each community needs to make kind of a, a sincere effort to make the aggregation plan available. And I think the DPU is looking to see that. So what that might look like is if you know, for example, there are specific language populations that you routinely make an effort to do translations for, we would wanna do those translations for this. Um, uh, if you know that there are particular agencies that you routinely loop in when you're trying to do some kind of community initiative, you would want to mention this to them and include them on some distribution information, uh, a distribution of information about this. But I don't think this would be the time for you to do a super deep dive and to try to do a lot of really um, tailored outreach because this isn't a time when we have real details around price, renewable energy contract, program start, program duration, and all the things, all those, all those answers to the questions that inevitably come up when we start to introduce this. So I think it is a time when you can do some outreach, kind of what, what seems to be like a reasonable amount of uh, open doors to make sure that the community has avenues in, but I don't think it's the time to kill yourself to really make sure that the outreach connections are made. I think that that's something, not that we should, any of us should kill ourselves, but I mean, bad metaphor, but I think that extra effort is what we would wanna put in closer to launch. Um, I feel like I just gave you a lot of words, but does that make sense? Beautifully clear. Yes. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Andrew has a question. Um, yeah. So given that we're uh, hoping to move quickly on forming our JPE um, and that that 
requires a um, community advisory committee, this might be actually an opportunity for us. Um, we have a, another motivation to do um, more in-depth outreach to a more diverse crowd. Um, and and want, we want to start the education process early on. So um, my question is, is it, um, is it feasible to do some summary documents? I don't see it making a lot of sense to translate the entire aggregation plan with all the legalese, you know, um, but to um, have a translation, well, an English version and translated versions of um, summaries that, that make clear the, the key issues that community members would be interested in. Yes, so uh, it's absolutely possible and, um, and, and not a strange thing to do either um, and certainly something we've done. So if you wanted to, for example, create an information sheet that kind of did a really um, high level look at how, you know, what aggregation is and how the program will work and that, you know, this program is being planned and you are, you know, welcome to and invited to submit comments on it. That kind of thing, I think, makes a lot of sense. Um, and it would be, I think, pretty straightforward to put something like that together and get it translated, if that would be helpful. Darcy? Yeah, two things. One is, um, I'm not taking notes on all of this because we're ha we have the recording. Is that okay? If That's I fine. Could summarize. And secondly, um, uh, is the public hearing just on the aggregation plan or is it on all of these documents? Um, so will the public be asked to comment on all of them? Um, it, technically speaking, it's all a good point, question is all of the documents. The, the plan is the one that's easiest to comment on. Um, but yes, they, and if they want, they're free to comment on any and all of them, and all of them will be presented for their review. Right. I guess I'm thinking that that um, the um, like our BIPOC community might be interested in commenting on the education and outreach plan itself uh, because they want a seat at the table. Um, so um, just just was wondering about that. Thanks. So if I could, if I could just offer a couple thoughts there. Um, one is the development of the education and outreach plan is something that requires um, a collaborative effort. It's not something we can kind of go away and do and then present to you wholesale because you folks know your communities well. So that's something that we will actually be able to provide you guys with a template to show you here's where we need input from you folks. And the creation of the document is something you are welcome to invite other people into. Um, so you don't need to wait until the public comment period for that. It's something that could happen even as the documents being created. So just wanted to put that out there. Um, second, I wonder if it would be helpful to just explain what that public uh, presentation typically looks like, um, because I, I can see it might seem strange to think we're gonna like hold up these four files, you know, on a screen and say, this exists, look at it. And this is, and that's not quite how, how we typically approach it because that, that is a very strange thing to do. The typical way we present this to the public is we, we put together a slide presentation that we make as visually as engaging as possible given that it's slides. Um, I really try to make it pretty. And uh, we take people through um, a consumer friendly explanation of what aggregation is and how it works and the rough timeline and when they can expect to hear information and what kind of options they'll have, what kind of control they'll have, those kinds of things, um, what their rights will be within the program. And then we say there are documents that are created in order to support this and those are available for your 
uh, review and comment if you'd like to. And here's how you would do that. So um, we do create a very consumer friendly presentation um, and, then, and then invite people to look at the documents. And then they're typically made available for download. Um, and also if people want to come to any town hall, they should be available in hard copy. But just to, wanted to put some shape to that so you guys could start to think through that as well and have a better sense for what that might look like. Thank you. We have a new DEI director here in Amherst. So I think, you know, for us, at least, I know we now have some other staff that can really help us in a more focused way than maybe we have been able to even in the past. Stephanie, DEI, what is that? A diversity okay, and inclusion. Of course, okay. Um, excellent. So I, I, I don't see any other other hands. I'll just keep um, rolling along with the next slide. So um, here's a list of some of the, the questions where we would need input in developing these documents. Um, one is the program name and, and whether you want a logo. And I know you have a name now. And we just wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, the next is the program options and the names of those options. So that, was, that needs to be um, specified in the aggregation plan. Um, so the issue of funding through an operational ladder, which I know you are interested in. Um, then some, a lot of questions around the outreach efforts. Um, and then some questions about new initiatives. I know you have an, uh, a strong interest in doing uh, innovative things through your program, and I want, we wanted to talk through that. Um, and then finally, the process for reviewing this supply contract. So the way our presentation is structured is we would just now just start walking through these issues. Um, and as I said earlier, I, I think the thing to do is we'll raise it. Maybe we could have a minute of discussion uh, or answer questions, but probably don't want to try to decide all these issues um, today. I don't think there's there's time, to, there's time to do all of that in, in one meeting. Um, so the first is the program name. And I know you have a name already, which is good to put you ahead of most folks at this stage. A question we had is whether Valley Green Energy is the name of the aggregation program um, or will that be the name of the, J, you know, the, the entity or is it both of those things? And um, that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a minor point, but it's something we should know in writing the aggregation plan because we'll need to refer to it. And we have below just for informational purposes, the names of a bunch of different aggregation programs. And I, I included there the Cape Light Compact towards the bottom left, which is the, the other, you know, group aggregation, true group aggregation like you. Um, and they have the, they are the Cape Light Compact is the entity. That's the name of the, the JPE. Um, they have run an aggregation program and they do other things, most significantly operate energy efficiency programs. Um, they tend to fudge a little bit whether Cape Light Compact is the name of the aggregation program or not. Sometimes they call the um, Cape Light Compact and that's how it appears in the materials mostly. But then sometimes they say it's the Cape Light Compact power supply program. So they, they, uh, they, 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 fudge this, they fudge this question a little bit, but that's, that's something for you to think about. Let me ask, maybe you have thought about this, is Valley Green Energy the program were you thinking, or is it that, would that, will that be the name of the JPE when it's formed? We did a lot, a lot of thinking about this, um, and we had a lot of discussion. So Valley Green Energy is the name of the aggregation, but the Valley Green Alliance is the JPE or will be the JPE. Uh, okay. All right. Excellent. So then we can check this one off. This is decided. So <laughs> already decided. So that's great. Thank you. Um, the next is whether or not you want the program logo. Um, um, Marlena, could you speak to that? Oh, uh, sure. Well, before I dive in, I'll ask, do you, have you already decided if you want one? If not, I can talk a little bit about the slide. If you've already made a decision there, I can I can save you the slide. We haven't made a decision about a logo. I would think we want one. Okay. Um, I can't see everybody, but let me do a little quick scan. Thumbs up if people want a logo. Thumbs up. 
and okay. and it actually now but now that we're talking about a logo it you know maybe that valley green alliance needs a logo that somehow blends with valley green energy and so but i think a logo definitely somehow without getting confusing okay um so we can definitely develop a logo for the valley green energy program and if the valley green if you just start to work on the Valley Green Alliance logo and need them to play well together, also doable. Or if you develop the program logo first, there's you develop the Alliance logo second. You know, whoever develops that, they can play well together. I think graphic designers can handle those kinds of challenges in a pretty straightforward way. Um, so that's that's great. We can help you do it, and I think that's pretty much all you need to hear on that point. Excellent. So the next question we had is the program options. And this, you're sure familiar with this general concept, which is many aggregation programs. Well, all aggregations have what's called the standard product, which is what customers become part of unless they choose something else. And then many aggregations also have optional project products, giving people different things they can choose if they want. Um, a very common structure is the standard product has some amount of additional renewable energy in it, additional over and above the state requirement. And then there's an upgrade product with 100% renewable energy. And many communities also have a step down product with has just the minimum amount of renewable energy. Um, the advantage to that is it's the lowest cost and it has a way of creating an option in the program for people who who want to spend as little as they can. Um, not everybody offers that optional basic product though. Um, as an example, the city of Worcester doesn't. So they have some additional green in their standard. They have an opt up to 100, but they don't offer a budget. But most, uh, let's say most programs have a, have a budget option. Um, it's not part of the plan, just to complete the thought. You don't have to decide in developing your plan how much renewable energy you would put in your standard. That you can decide later after your plan's approved, after you go out to bid. And so you see what the price of the additional renewable energy would be. So you can make that decision later. But you do in the plan need to discuss the structure and say something to the effect of, we have a standard product. It's going to have some extra renewables in it. We're going to decide on the sum later you know, what sum equals later, and then we're going to have a budget and then we're going to have 100% renewable. So you need to need to decide the buckets, but you don't need to decide the exact composition of the standard bucket. Adele had her hand up. Yeah, I wonder if you could clarify for us what you mean by uh, the amount of green. Um, is it all about RECs or is there some aspect of it that's about actual purchase? of um, renewable electricity? Well, so that's a good question. So the way most communities, maybe pretty much all at this point do it is by extra recs. And so, and that's the, that's the, that's the standard in Massachusetts and throughout New England where renewable energy content is determined by your recs. If you would like to do something different though, you're able, you know, you would be able to do that here, you know, as an example, one of the communities we work with is, is looking at entering into a, a virtual power purchase agreement with a new renewable project, and they'll be getting um, uh, the output, they'll be purchasing the output of that project. You can do that. You could, if you wanted, you could enter a bundled contract for electricity and recs for a renewable project. There are bunches of ways you could do it. Um, it's, if it's Rex, it's the easiest thing. If it's something beyond that, which is maybe where you wanna go, we'll need to just figure out how to describe that to the DPU that's kind of clear enough because uh, to, to satisfy them at this point. And I'll say just stepping back a bit, there's an increasing tension between communities and developing and aggregation plans who want to maintain the maximum amount of flexibility for their programs. And that's one push out of the push. The pushback is from the Department of Public Utilities, which is pushing for more specificity in those plans. So we're, we have a, a, we'll have a, a dance with them about how specific to get, but we'll want to start 
with what you want to do. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, kind of often you have the three options. How many options might a community offer? And I'm thinking for us, standard green, 100% renewable, the budget option. And then, you know, there's the creative special case option that we might want to add in. Um, yet to be determined, argue with, you need to argue with the DPU over it. Um, uh, is that just getting to be too many, your opinion, is that just too many options confusing folks or is that a possibility? Um, I, I'd say two things there. So if you were thinking that the options would be the same but different amounts, so standard has 10% renewables, then you can choose 50%, then you could choose 100%, then you could choose budget, we'd probably discourage you, although we'd be happy to do what you want, but we would let you know having a 50% and 100% option probably doesn't really get you that much. The distinctions are small to people and not that many people participate. But if you want something that's really different, mm -hmm. that would be lots of fun. And I, I personally could see value in that, although we'd have a challenge, of course, explaining it to people. But um, you know, if they're basic rec options, I'd stick with the three. But if you want something really different, that would be a good, a good case for a four. Okay, thanks. Chris, did you have anything yeah. in mind for that? Just, I'm um, just more curious. Sure. Um, so I, I'm going to put it out there for a lot of future discussion. But the fourth would be, say, um, you know, supporting locals, supporting local option, um, or uh, so, um, greenhouse gas reduction option, or and you know, the idea being that that would be tied into um, supporting either local renewable energy, you know really dreaming supporting some kind of electric vehicle charging stations or something, or um, what was the other one I was, any kind of demand side management, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, that, that's just mm -hmm. really being wide open and a lot of what we'd be focusing on is doing stuff local. Uh, so, you know, really this is not just buying recs outside the community, this is the community trying to do something that could possibly be tied into this and, um, and supported by this. Thanks. Darcy has her hand up. Yeah, I like that idea, Chris. Um, I, yeah, I was also thinking of the possibility of just, uh, you know, an option focusing on the source of the electricity uh, being local. So, you know, within the within the the um, the joint powers entity geographic area. Thanks, Darcy. Anybody else? Does Tom have his hand up? Tom, do you have your hand up? I, oh, yeah. I have my hand up, yes. Um, Paul, is, I'm not tracking it. What's, um, how will these options fare uh, compared to just buying dirty power and stay, you know, if they opt out, uh, essentially, how, how do these, how will these rates fare? Do you have any sense of it at this point? Um, yeah, so, I mean, typically, the if you have a budget option, which has no extra renewables, you can assume that that's going to be basically the same cost as basic service or most communities now have a price for their budget option, which is actually less than basic service. So um, you can't promise that, no guarantee that that's gonna happen, but that has been the experience for most communities lately. So the, I think that if I can offer a friendly amendment to your question is how much extra would the renewables cost over and above the lowest you could pay, which is probably budget within the program. So there, I'm trying to think, Kim, do you have these num any of these numbers at the top of your mind on what we've seen in bids lately? Uh, we may have lost Kim. So 
Sorry, no, um, I'm, I'm here. Um, uh, let me just try to pull something up quickly. I, I don't have it on the off the top of my head, but um, <clears throat> I do have something I can pull up quickly that I was just taking a look at. Um, So, yeah, so I have um, in one that we've looked at recently at comparing a, a budget option to adding say 20% um, additional mass class one recs <clears throat> adds about uh, seven and a half mils um, to the price. So uh, less than a, less than a penny um, to the price to add 20% additional class one recs. And that's typically what people choose to add would be, um, what they call the Massachusetts class one, um, that's greener, um, and more local than, um, the national wind recs, which would, could come from Texas. This would be, um, a, a local renewable, um, in New England. Thank you. That's very helpful. Mm -hmm. Kind of add on question um, talking about recs. You know, one idea Massachusetts has a lot of different kind of recs. So they also have alternative, I don't know, I forgot what they're called, basically heating recs, and they have demand reduction, you know, demand supply. I forgot what they're called. Um, has anybody moved, uh, put those in? Do you think DPU would allow that? Um, and how would that kind of fit into one of these, this program structure as an idea, as an initial idea, just to kind of kick it off? Mm -hmm. Um, it, yeah, it would certainly be allowed. Um, and we, yes, we could make it some of the other ones, just as this might probably wouldn't be your choice, but just as an example that's happened, um, some communities purchase class two recs rather than class ones. Class two recs are from ex older renewable projects in New England. So they have the, their, they're from the region. They're not from outside the region like the national recs, but they're from older projects. So there's no, no benefit of helping to create new projects. But yes, you could, you could do that. And as another example, at one point, Cambridge included uh, just solar, just the had to be solar recs where they're all the only additional recs they would, they would accept. So yes, that would be a, that would be an issue that we could, that we could consider and that, that would be possible. Darcy? I have one more question. I just wondered if um, the 100% 100 renew 100 renewable option, um, since it pretty much has to be Rex, um, have you seen it with just using class one Rex? Yes, it's almost always that way. So, or most towns, most towns make it all class ones. And then some get a little bit more specific than that. So, because class one, even class one is a pretty broad category. So, some communities say class one recs, but not including biomass recs. So, biomass counts as class one, but they are, they're, they're also polluting. So, some communities say let's exclude those. Others can specify, some specify only wind and solar. So, only wind and solar class one recs. Thank you. Um, those are e easy ish, easy, easy ish things um, to do, you know, particular types of recs, um, specifying location of recs, not impossible, but that's a little harder to do. So if, if we wanted to really promote local, whether it's solar thermal, you know, people putting on uh, uh, solar hot water systems or something like that, could a program possibly say, you know, if you're doing this in our community, we will buy the recs from you. And then that cost is passed on to customers um, to like a, through a, a local recs option. Um, you could, the, and there, there are two pathways for buying the recs and I'll, I'll just um, mention them. So typically the way the recs are purchased is the supplier purchases them. 
Um, and that's the best way to go when you're dealing with like normal class one recs because these are very big purchasers of class one recs. So they're, they buy at very high volumes and they get really good prices on them. Um, but it does become very cumbersome to ask them to purchase something that's out of their normal pattern. So if you wanted to do something much more targeted, the bet, the probably the better way will turn out to be that you would use your adder for it and you would use your adder and then you know, you would or we would on your behalf making rec purchases from specific producers at small scale. Um, the big suppliers don't like to do that, but you know, you could do that, we could do that, and that would be the way to get these local recs, very local recs. And I believe the Cape Light Compact does something similar. So they use their adder to create a fund that they use to buy these really, really local recs from local projects. Well, could you actually go beyond local recs? Like if the standard state-sponsored recs was X amount, <laughs> could you offer a local local addition? Um, just really trying to see what you know we can use this program to encourage um, local implementation and energy efficiency and thermal and stuff like that. Yes. No. Absolutely. So you could do any kind of combination there. Um, I, the, the only point I was trying to make there is that insofar as you're, you're making, you know, very thoughtful purchases from particular local projects, which would tend to be small. No, I, I, I got that. Keep that separate yeah, okay. from the, okay. the purchase. No, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. But you can certainly do both. I just want to clarify something that I said earlier when I was talking about price. Um, I was referring to the supply price of the program and that it would it would add um, you know less than a penny to add twenty percent. So say the program price was fifteen cents for that basic option, it would become in this case the the cost of Rex is you know uh, seven point five mils. So that would change the price to fifteen point seven five. But the cost to consumers. Um, for a month would be around, depending on what the average KWH is in the towns, it would be around $4 um, a month to the average consumer. So just wanted to make that clarification when I was talking about a penny and everything that was more the supply price than what it's gonna cost um, consumers. Does Kim, anybody else have questions or comments? Okay. All right, great. So the, um, the, the next thing you'll need to decide is in addition to what you want your options to be, you need to have names for them so that you can refer to them in the plan and in the opt-out letter and elsewhere. So here are, it just for your consideration, you know, examples of common naming practices. Usually the, it starts with the name of the program. So you know, if it's a town, it would be the, you know, the, the Newton standard, for example. If in your case, we were thinking it would be VGE or it could be Valley Green Energy, that might be better. Um, so that the name of the, the, the program and then something that indicates it's the standard one, something that indicates it's the extra renewable one and something that indicates it's the lower cost one. And, you don't need to decide these today's, but you, you will, as part of your plan, you'll need to, you'll need to make these decisions. Um, the next thing, which is a bigger question is, I which I know you were interested in was, um, was funding and ch charging uh, what's known as an operational adder. So, um, you know, that, that has been approved for many plans. If you were to collect the typical amount, which is one tenth of a cent per kilowatt hour, um, we estimate that would be about one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars per year for you. Um, that's an estimate. The actual amount will depend on, um, you know, kilowatt hour sales through the program, and our estimate is based on some information about what how much electricity is used by the people in the communities, and then some assumptions about how many of them are on basic service and then how many of them would opt out. But ballpark, it's about 125,000 a year. 
Um, it has to be used for program related expenses. So you couldn't take the $125,000 and use it to buy fire trucks, for example, it has to be related to the program. Um, very commonly, it's used to provide salary support for a staff person who works on the program. Um, and then I looked up the Cape Light Compact, who has a, you know, the only other JPE, and they use it to cover all of their operating expenses. So not just staffing, but rent and legal and advertising, all of the operational expenses of the, the JPE um, are paid with the adder. Those, those uses are pretty easy to get DPU approval for. If you want to do something more creative, for example, using it to pay for electric vehicle chargers or um, to buy these you know, targeted local recs, something like that, um, you're gonna have to make more of a case to the Department of Public Utilities. It's not that they say no, but when someone suggests they want to use the funds for anything beyond a staff person, they've been asking to see a lot of detail about what you plan to do excuse me, what the budget is, et cetera. So we would, we would need to, to work that out. Um, one of the questions was, is there any, like anything new from the DPU on this point? Um, and unfortunately the answer is no. Most, you know, most communities have just, because the DPU makes it hard to spend the adder on anything other than a staff person, most communities are just using it for a staff person at this, at this point but doesn't mean you can't um, push to, to use it for something for something else. So Paul, you may not know because of that fact, um, but is this something that you, we, we have to have defined before we go to the DPU? Uh, is there any way to kind of go back two years later when you want to add something new? Um, you know, what level of flexibility is there in this? Yep. You really have to plan it out in detail in advance. Yes. Good question. So there are two possible pathways here. So one pathway would be in the plan you file, say, we want to use the, 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 the adder for X, Y, and Z, but make the language pretty general. If you do that, six months or so later, you're going to get some questions from the DPU and they're going to say, tell us more exactly about how you're planning to use that adder money. And if you satisfy them at that stage, they'll let you use it for the other things. Um, and if you don't satisfy them, they'll just approve the staff person. So one path is file something general but broad and then use the, the, the within the approval process, add more definition. And that gives you like six more months to, to figure it out. Alternatively, you can file it with a limited authorization. Um, then you can add to it, but so far the DPU is saying you, you need to amend your plan. And amending the plan means filing a whole new plan. So that's uh, not that it's a ton of work, but it's, it goes to the, back to the beginning of the DPU review process. So that's probably another year plus um, to get that approval in place. but not a lot of flexibility. <laughs> yes, I directly answered your question. That's what I would have said. Yes, not a lot of flexibility. Okay, Darcy has her hand up. Just wondering if it would be possible to ask for a larger adder. Yes, um, it would be possible. Um, and you just have to justify it. So you're gonna get pushback on it if you ask for more than a 10th of a cent. But the pushback's gonna be, tell us how you're gonna use that money. And if you can make a good case for how you're gonna use it, you should be okay. What, what, what the DPU has really resisted is people who are asking for money without a clear plan for how they're gonna use it. So. You know, when it's a when it's a small community and we're talking about 50 grand and the town says, well, we're going to use it to fund a portion of a salary. That seems reasonable. The DPU just accepts that. But when in the case of the city of Boston, for example, that was asking that the tenth of a cent, but a tenth of a cent for Boston, you know, is more like a million bucks than 50,000 bucks. 
the DPU said, how are you going to spend this money? And they said, well, we're going to have a staff person. And the DPU said, well, uh, staff, you're not paying anybody a million dollars, so we're not going to let you collect the tenth of a cent. You're going to collect uh, you know, two hundredths of a cent or something. So you can ask for more. You just have to show what you would spend you'd spend it on. They they don't want communities to get big funds here without without clarity about how those funds would be used. And is the it is the criteria that they are using to decide in their regulations or is it just past practice or what what is it based on? Yeah. <laughs> It isn't really. I mean, it's not really based on anything. So, so far, it, because they haven't approved anything other than the staff person lately, um, we don't know really what it's based on. You know, the core of it is that it has to be program related. And that is a matter of state law because it's a, this is what's called the program fee. And so program fees have to be spent on the program. And that's a settled principle. But the DPU, when they look at this, they say, well, yeah, we're going to look at a bunch of other stuff too, but there's no, there's no clarity on what that means or what criteria they would apply. If this well, is the first plan where they approve something creative, then we'll know, but we'll, they'll, be, they'll be figuring it out with us. Okay, two more questions. Instead of a staff person, do they ever let you use money to hire a third-party contractor? It hasn't been presented that way, but I couldn't, I don't think they would object. We would just need to explain how that, how, what that contractor would do is different from what we do, because we get paid through a separate adder in the plan. So they'll say, they'll just say, well, what's the difference? You know, you guys have mass power choice. What are they doing? What would this other person be? But if we can describe it as something different, which it would be, of course, that, that that should be okay. I don't think this there's magic to it being an employee versus not an employee. Okay, the reason I'm asking is, you know, a thought in my mind is something to use this for would be wonderful would be to actually um, contract with a third party to do strong promotional outreach on energy related stuff altogether. It could be helping landlords um, switch over to electrify their heating systems. Um, uh, so that's kind of like another local idea, somehow funding some kind of outreach, strong outreach and education program and handholding um, that um, enhances a mass save program, doesn't supplement it, um, that kind of thing. Hey, hey Paul. Um, yes. This is Sam here. I, I recall you mentioning that um, you guys are working with an aggregation program or a community um, seeking DPU approval for its aggregation program to collect an operational adder to use for energy efficiency related activities, which I believe you said was a novel uh, attempt. And I'm just wondering if, if that's accurate and what the status is of that request. Yes. So it, it it, and that that has changed over time. So the city of Worcester wanted to use their adder to support energy efficiency initiatives, which they wanted to be, you know, supplemental to Mass Save, not con uh, contradictory in any way or conflicting. Um, that was in their original plan as we filed it. So that's probably the, the status where we discussed this the most. Um, Worcester got a lot of pushback both from DPU staff and National Grid about it. National Grid was afraid it was gonna conflict with their programs. And it didn't seem to be ultimately an unsolvable issue, but it was made very clear to Worcester that if they wanted their plan proved, approved anytime soon, they should withdraw this energy efficiency idea because it would be a long fight. And so they did that in the interest of getting the plan approved it's still their intention to go back with a plan amendment to add that because it does seem like a very good thing to do. And conceptually, it's quite consistent with what Chris just outlined, which is let's do something that enhances mass save through the program. Um, and that was always their intent, but they, they had to abandon it temporarily. 
in the interest of getting the plan approved fast. Got it, thank you. Other questions? Okay, I guess we can move on. All right. Um, so the next the next area to discuss is outreach and education. Um, Marlena, would you like to take over from here? Sure, um, and I'll try to I'll try to I guess keep this kind of brief because I know we've been running long. Um, so this is all about the out, out, excuse me education and outreach plan, which is a supplementary document that gets presented to the public and filed with the DPU along with the aggregation plan. And the document has to address all the phases of outreach, which are here on the slide. So that means, and it's what we showed you in the timeline. So that means everything during the planning and regulatory approval phase, including the public presentation of the plan, then the program launch outreach, which is more intense period right before launch, the DPU has stronger opinions about, and then whatever you plan to do um, after launch. And there are some DPU requirements around things that you have to say and do after launch. So this is this is what we would document in the outreach and education plan that I referenced before. And we would create a template document for you that would say, this text is required by the DPU, here's what you need to fill in. This part's required, here's what you need to fill in to make it easy. Um, so that's, that's one of the, the early next steps that I would pursue with you. Any questions here? Adele? Um, this is a related question um, because it involves uh, how to explain the program and, and, uh, and I see uh, electricity bill mentioned a number of times. Um, let's just say, and, and you know, we want to consider uh, some novel way of funding some of what we want to do, um, which might not be on the electricity bill. Is there, is there any way to include such a mechanism um, under an aggregation plan that does not involve the electricity bill? Do you mean as a funding source? Yes, as a, as a, um, to pay for other programs, uh, program related expenses um, that would go beyond what normally is included. For, you know, we've mentioned a bunch of them already uh, today, um, but let's just say that we wanted to use some other mechanism besides the electricity bill. Um, yes, yeah, so you could do that. And the, the, the great, um, opportunity that would open for you is that if you're not looking to fund it through this ad or collect it through the electricity bill, it's no longer part of the aggregation program, technically, as far as the DPU is concerned. So you're free to do whatever you want. You, you don't have to deal with deep, you only have to deal with DPU oversight in mm -hmm. the, within the four corners of the aggregation plan. So other funding sources bring with them much more freedom. Gotcha, thank you. All right, let me pop on to the next one. Uh, so I, I recall one of the questions was, you all were interested in knowing what kind of support we provide for outreach and education, um, lots. So I already mentioned logo development. We're happy to do that for you. We also will help you draft announcements and media releases, uh, build and manage the program website. There's a lot of requirements around the content of that website from a regulatory perspective that have to be kept up to date. Um, and then just generally a lot of information. So we, we do that all for you. Um, we design and cover the cost of printing and fabricating materials, um, including electronic materials like social media graphics, um, we create and deliver presentations. We cover translations and interpreting. Yard signs aren't on there, but we'll do that too. Um, so pretty much we cover the outreach around the program would be the summary statement I would, I would offer there for you. 
then I just gave you some pretty pictures on the right so you can see some of the kinds of things we've done, but we would obviously create something special for you guys. Darcy has a question. Uh, and would, would the website be a joint website that each municipality would then somehow link to on their own municipal websites or how would that work? Well, I mean, I guess that's a decision for you guys, but I think that would make the most sense to the public rather than um, maybe having three different websites uh, with similar names. And I, I think from a regulatory perspective, if you have a, a single program that you're launching, having a single website is fine. Uh, but you're quite right that each community would need to link over to it. In fact, that's a regulatory requirement that um, municipal websites have to maintain a prominent link to the aggregation website at all times uh, prior to uh, the launch, during launch, and in perpetuity after launch. But I think we could create a single one if that works for you guys. And I think it would be easier to manage, uh, speaking from the perspective of the team that would be likely managing the content. Personally, I think we would want consistency and that would be the easiest way to ensure that we have that. Yeah, agreed. Yes, I think that's right. And I'll just add, I think from a regulatory perspective, from a DPU perspective, it's one program. It's not three programs. So they, they would want one, they would want one website for the three with links to the individual community websites. Um, all right, and then just moving along, then the other thing we talked a little bit about this before, and this would be an area for a lot more discussion, um, the, you know, the chance to do new initiatives through the program. Um, key things um, are whether these new initiatives are technically part of the aggregation program, in which case they have to be in the plan and the DPU is gonna regulate them or whether maybe they're related, but not part of the technically part of the aggregation program, in which case you have a lot more flexibility. So that's one issue to discuss. And then there's also timing, um, you know, similar to points Chris made earlier, what do you want to put in the plan initially to get that approved? And then, you know, the things that you might want to add later and, and deciding whether to include something new early, which might slow things down a little bit versus adding that new thing later after the plan is up and going, but then there's, a, you know, there are delays in getting that new initiative approved later through an amended plan. So these are the, the sorts of issues we need to discuss, but this is, uh, you know, a great big, a great big topic here, the new initiatives. Well, I just, I just want to kind of um, put a question out there kind of the other way, instead of kind of proposing something I want to do is, I want to put out something I want to, I hope to um, uh, accomplish here. So, uh, you know, my position has got, is defined at working in all city sectors. So that means business, residential. I almost work 100%, probably 95%, 98% on city facilities because I just don't have enough time to, to do a public facing outreach. And um, I think that Stephanie could probably say the same thing. It, I would love it if, whether it's the JPA, I'm mean, sorry, whether it's Valley Green Energy and or Valley Green Alliance, that it provides some kind of a way of doing a pub, you know, a public outreaching program. So we're really engaged in the community. So just keeping that in mind, you know, how might that fit in here? How might that be accomplished? Well, I, if, if I'm understanding, Chris, I'd say that, you know, th this is a, a, the, a program like this is, is like ideally suited for touching the community. That's what it does well, particularly residents. That's, that's what's great about these programs. And for, you know, many communities, in our experience, struggle with just the issues that you mentioned, that the community wants to pursue sustainability with regard to the municipal facilities, they've got they've got levers, they've got ways to do that, but it's much harder to influence the residents, both from a time perspective and because it it they, you don't control what the residents do. A program like this is is designed exactly for the residents, so it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a way to address that that part of the city. 
Yeah, that's great. I will um, concur with Chris that that's been our challenge here too. And one of the things we struggle with, even with our energy committee, um, you know, how we reach the residents. It's the thing that I said right from the, you know, the get go is, you know, we have plenty of control on municipal facilities, but the largest contributor to our greenhouse gas emissions is not the municipal sector, which is only like 3%. You know, it's really the residential um, is one of our biggest blocks. So, you know, I, I agree and I, I do see the opportunity here. I think it's great. So thank you. Adele has her question. I'm uh, I'm having trouble understanding this last point uh, because previously it sounded like Worcester, for example, really wanted to do more outreach to say residents, um, but but DPU is pushing back on that idea. So can you clarify what we're talking about now that's different from what Worcester was trying to do? Um. Good question. So the issue that Worcester ran into was they said they wanted to use, they wanted to run an energy efficiency program for the residents using money collected through the aggregation. And the pushback they got from both the DPU and National Grid was, well, we have the mass safe programs that are funded by ratepayers in other ways. We don't want you to do something that conflicts with what what the mass save programs are doing and worcester's response was well of course we're not going to conflict with mass save that would be stupid we want to create more not less but the dpu and national grid said well you got to prove that to us and we're gonna we're gonna make that a rigorous thing for you to prove that so the stepping back the 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 issue with with worcester was particularly focused on energy efficiency where the mass safe programs exist and concerns about conflict with those. So if, if uh, this pays for a staff person and that staff person also does something like runs a solarized program, um, uh, well, that's, I mean, could, could that something like that be possible? Um, so in an ideal world, what you would pay is the percentage of the person's personnel costs that were related to the work on this program, not the solarized program. In practice, no one digs into that, you know, down to the penny, but that's, that's the principle. And so most communities that do it, if the program, aggregation program doesn't require a full staff person, will pay a portion of that person's cost. If we, um, sorry, everybody, if I'm taking up a lot more time here, but if we, um, if we went to the DPU already with an identified fund to help some kind of a, a source to supplement a staff person, knowing that that supplemental money would be used to do broader public outreach, um, do you think DPU would be more likely to approve stuff? Um, how, that, how would that affect it? mean saying, are you asking, let's say a staff person costs $100,000 just for a round number. Let's say you go and say, okay, we want 50 grand through the aggregation plan and we've already got the other 50 somewhere else. Right. I'm thinking, you know, in that case, the, the money would be coming in from the Valley Green Alliance. So it would be, you know, basically the one staff person is kind of working on both or maybe one and a half staff person or two staff people where one is working on the aggregation the other one is working on more broad or another, you know, part of it is working more broadly, but they're really one person. Yep. Um, yeah. I, mean, I, I think that would be fine, although that the DPU hasn't asked for that so far. So they haven't, they've only looked at how much aggregation money is going to the staff person. They haven't asked, how are you funding the rest of that person? That actually sounds like a better way to go. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> So we don't have to necess. So hmm. I'm just trying to be clear about this. So if we had someone who is, you know, supported by the aggregation adder, who was doing some additional work, we wouldn't necessarily have to 
have that specifically spelled out or we do have to, I, I guess I'm still a little unclear. Yeah. Yes. Um, what, what you need to do is to say what you would do with the aggregation money. You don't need to say what else you're doing. So you can just say, we want just round numbers, $50,000 and then for a portion of the cost of that person who's going to work on the program, period. The DPU doesn't need to know how you're funding the rest of that person's time or whether you're funding the rest of that person's time. It might be a part-time position. And so it could be anything. The DPU doesn't care. Or the person's working for free, a million things, but they don't, they're not worried about that. They're only worried about their little world. They're really worried about that world, but they don't worry about what happens outside their world. So you just need to say what you would do and what you would spend the money on. Okay. It sounds like once you've got a reasonable amount to spend on staff, then it's pretty flexible at that point. DPU kind of says staff person for this. Okay, good. Yeah. And they don't. Yeah, they, 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 yeah they're not going to challenge you on the fringe rate or the health insurance or anything like that. Yeah, I was a little surprised. I mean, I don't think I, and maybe we were told this before when we spoke with folks from Cape Light Compact, but I didn't realize we could use the ADR for rent and, you know, other supplemental costs like insurance and that kind of thing. I didn't, I don't think I realized that. I thought we were feeling like we'd have to come up with some of that too. But I, I so I'm thinking that if, if this person if you know is sort of housed for lack of a better word in the jpe they're working in the jpe but they're doing this work in the jpe so the rent for the jpe could essentially be covered by that adder is that correct if they're doing the work for the aggregation it's to the point that you just made that they're not they're just asking how's that money being spent but not specifically what portion of it is for the jpe is that correct mm -hmm. Yes, that's that's how I understand it. I mean, the Cape, and we'll really should. I think it would be prudent to dig into more with the Cape, and I'm sure they they'd share information with us. But this is how I understand that it works, and it's consistent with what they file with the DPU. So they say we're using it for administrative costs, and they sub actually submit a cost schedule which has, you know, travel a thousand dollars, you know, everything from staff to legal down to travel and little things all broken out in there. So um, what, what, I guess what I don't know, I guess what we'd have to dig out is let's say the JPE did four things, one of which was the aggregation. You know, they, they probably in an ideal world would want the, the aggregation paying a portion of the rent, a portion of the legal fees, a portion of other things. We might want to have a little we do a little analysis of that with them. Okay. So they'd still expect the JPE to be contributing to a portion of that. Like they, the, all of the rent couldn't be covered by the aggregation. If the JPE did other things, I don't think so, okay. but there's, we'd have to feel it out. It isn't, there aren't announced rules on this. All we know is, you know, what the Cape Light Compact does and, and what's been approved. And but we could have a conversation with the DPU, or we could certainly have a conversation with the Cape Light Compact, and then and make our best plan. Okay, thanks, Stefan. You can ask a quick question. Yes, absolutely. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to go back to the website topic for a moment um, because Northampton, Amherst, and Pelham's. Uh, are, are in process of forming a JPE that contemplates doing more than just administering the aggregation program. <clears throat> so using the Cape Light Compact as an example where the compact does multiple things, including its aggregation program. And so on its website, the aggregation program is nested within the, the broader um, JPE website. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how, you know, we would address our, you know, related sort of website um, issues I mean you know the RJP is not yet formed and I don't the communities haven't determined the specifics of what it would do beyond aggregation or the timeline so I think that's probably why nobody has any specifics right now in terms of how they'd want to see those things integrate but that seems like that's an inevitable 
um, question that needs to be addressed at some point. Yes, I mean, I'd say that's something we should we should think about that. I don't think we had thought about that either, so. Another meeting, another discussion. Yeah, I would think that we would want Valley Green Alliance to be launched at the same time as Valley Green Energy with the Valley Green Energy as a program of Valley Green Alliance. Maybe the only program, be really nice to have one other program to go along with it. But. <laughs> All right, I'll make a note for us to come back to that. And then um, I think the last thing we had, which we don't need to spend any time on today is there will need to be um, legal counsel review of this supply contract. Hopefully that will be pro forma because it's a model agreement and there's a very big advantages to using the model agreement, which means that the, the approach legal counsel, we encourage legal counsel to take is review it make sure there's nothing in there that gives you, you think is a huge issue, but don't come back to us with a hundred little, you know, line edits and nits and nats because then you're not in the model agreement anymore. And once you're not in the model agreement, it becomes a much bigger deal trying to get the suppliers to, to work with you because from their perspective, it's way more efficient if all the towns are using the same contract. So um, that can be a conversation for another day. We don't need to deal with it now, but that's that's the issue there. It's a big, big advantage to using the model. Um, and the challenge, you give any contract to any lawyer, they can think of a hundred ways to make it better, but it doesn't make it better if it takes you out of the model. Um, and then I think our last thing was just uh, was just next steps and how we, how we work from here. So we, um... We do meet every two weeks. So I'm, and I'm sort of putting this up to the group and I know Tom already had to leave, but I'm just envisioning that we're gonna be putting you on our agenda <laughs> for each meeting going forward um, for covering at least one or more topics. So I guess we would say, what is the next thing you see as us needing to do with you. So what are the, you know, what's the next big decision that we need to make? And we could just put that on our agenda in two weeks. Marlene, would you think it's the outreach plan? Would that be the, the thing to focus on first? So yes, just going back to kind of what our big next milestone is, it's the presentation of this array of documents, the aggregation plan, the education outreach plan, the mailing materials in the draft contract to the public. That's kind of the milestone we're working toward. The aggregation plan and the contract are kind of what they are. The aggregation plan has room for some input, but a lot of it is pretty structured. And once you work through some of these discussions, these topics that we've just gone through, the format of the document is kind of set. The education and outreach plan though, is something that does require I think a bit more back and forth time investment. So I would imagine we might start there. Um, as I mentioned before, I would give you a, a draft document, like a template document that's heavily annotated to say, this language is required. This is where we need some input. And it would give you also just kind of a sense of the structure and what are the different chunks of time? Like what are the different parts of this process? When, when, when might we do outreach? and what might it include. Um, so what we could think about doing is having that available for you. That's not something I think that we would necessarily talk through constructively as a group, although perhaps it is. It's something you might want to digest for a bit and have some side conversations and figure out how, how we want to tackle it. Um, but given that it's a document and you know we have to fill it in and write it, um, what I could do is we could try to have that available for you in the next two weeks, um, maybe shortly before the meeting and we could talk through it and then you could kind of take it away. And you know, those of you that wanna actually manipulate the document could, could do it if that would make sense. And, and once, once we get some of those other discussions um, like conversations like around program name and things settled then I can also go ahead and draft the letter. That's the other thing that really uh, inspires conversation. The an automatic enrollment notification letter, which the DPU calls the opt-out letter. It's, um, 
it's not something where the town has a, or towns have a lot of flexibility in what they can say, but there are some pieces that you can have some flexibility with, but you just, you need to see it. You need to kind of get comfortable with the animal that it is. When the regulators help write anything, it's, you know, it's not poetry. So um, it's good to adjust, adjust yourselves to that early. So we'll send you a draft of that, but I would start with the, I would start with the aggregation plan and as that goes, we get feedback from that, then I think the next step would be to turn to the letter. And along the way, I think we might be having some of these other conversations on the topics that we discussed today. And then we can use those to inform the aggregation plan itself. Uh, so I would imagine kind of that order, that's roughly the order we're following with other communities. So it might work for you guys. And then I think the contract piece that follows its own path um, with town, town's council, approval and a review and approval. Does that sound right, Paul? Yes. So I think I think for the next meeting would be let's 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 talk about the outreach and education plan and figure out how to tackle that. And, and I think maybe a good goal would be to send it to you shortly before the meeting so you can see it and then we can kind of figure out from there what how to use the meeting. Sounds good. Okay. Chris has a question. No, it was just step, step to comment. I mean, I think another thing that's going to be should be earlier than later is us deciding what kind of offerings we want to offer. You know, the um, we need to define that because that's going to have to for trying to be creative. We're going to have to have some good arguments for whatever we want to do. Yes, yeah, we can certainly tackle different things in a meeting. So we don't have to only focus on the outreach and education plan, and then. Once that's done, move to discussing what the program offerings are. We can we can multitask. No, starting with the education outreach plan sounds makes sense to me, um, but I think internally we're going to have to start talking about the offerings for sure. And I'm wondering about the web presence. Um, just of our initial, you know, we have a we sort of have our working group page. Um, which is just about finding the materials for these meetings, minutes, you know, it's a place for the public to go just to find us. Um, and I don't know how that will interact with the Valley Green Energy page, because that's obviously going to be something separate. I mean, maybe it just links to it, but we can maybe have that discussion as well. Um, is there any other, I, I mean, our, so typically our meetings are an hour, we can make them longer if we need to, although I feel like typically even if we make them longer, we lose people. <laughs> so um, does an hour seem sufficient or do you think we need to do an hour and a half? What would make sense in your experience? Especially because you are working with three communities. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I'll say, and I don't know if others have, uh, on our team have a different experience. I think what we want is that the time that works for you, and if and if it's an hour is what people, you know, your full group can give, let's use an hour. We can. I mean, today we covered a whole lot, you know, big, broad overview stuff. We'll be more targeted in what we try to accomplish. Try to set up the meetings for things we can do in an hour. And if you can keep, if that makes that's most comfortable for keeping the team together, I, I would be inclined to do that. Okay, Chris. Oh, can you send us your um, slides? You yeah, I, I need I need them to post them because I just legally have to. Oh, good. So they'll be part of the minutes then too. They'll they'll be part of the yeah. They'll be yes. They'll be accessible on the site, on the web page, our working group sure. web page. It'll be part. I'll be actually putting them in the meeting packet, Chris. That's where you'll find them, the meeting packet materials for this meeting. Okay. Anything else? Thank you all so much. Um, it's really exciting to be moving forward with this. And um, I know we've waited a long time. So thank you for your patience. Thank you for putting that presentation together. I think that really helped. Are there any outstanding questions any of the working group members had that they didn't feel got addressed? Um, that, you know, here's now's your opportunity. 
Great. Okay, then our uh, next. Oh, go ahead, Darcy. I do have one question, and I because I was really interested to hear about the um, um, the the Senate budget item that you mentioned um, that would you know prevent DPU from taking longer than six months. Is that uh, something that we should be advocating, or do you know if there's any organized effort to advocate around that? I know that some towns advocated for it. I think we're probably in the process. So I think they're probably far along in the process now that there's probably um, no further opportunity for advocacy. I'm guessing just where we are, they're kind of tying up the details on that. Um, if it ends up in the joint House Senate budget, um, then there might be an opportunity for advocacy with the governor because the, the budget will go to the governor and the governor would have an opportunity to veto that provision if he wanted. So. I think it's probably too late to, for the legislature, but if the legislature's budget has it in the final budget, then then there'd be a chance to talk to the gover governor. Now, I, I'm, but I'm not saying it's bad to advocate for it either. I'm, my guess is it's too late, but I don't really know. The, the budget committee, the budget negotiations is known as the conference committee. It's very much black box. So you don't really know what they're doing. And it's like selecting a Pope, you know, you don't know what's going on until the smoke comes up at the end. So. Um, I can, if I can send, if it's helpful, I can send Stephanie a, a reference to the budget provision, and then you guys can decide, to, to, you know, whether you want to take a further step. Yeah, that would be great. Thanks. Great. Thank you. All right, then our next meeting will be July 22nd at 10 a.m. Very good. Thank you all so, so much. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Bye, Thanks. Bye all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.